Hello, everyone. My name is Angela Zhang. I'm the director of the Center for Chinese Law. Our second webinar in this Law and uh, Common Prosperity series will focus on China's new tax policies, particularly on how it might affect China's ultra-rich as well as the tech uh, giants. And I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Daisy Dai, an assistant professor of law at the Shanghai University for Finance and Economics to share with us her insights into this very timely topic. Daisy is educated in both the United States and in China and have years of experience teaching and advising on tax matters. She will start with a presentation today to first give us an overview of the tax policy in relation to the top owners, uh, as well as to online platforms. And then I will ask her a few questions before uh, we open up the floor for questions. I also encourage our audience to write your questions in the chat box and indicate your affiliation and your name, if possible. So without further ado, let me give the floor to Daisy. Thank you very much for the introduction and thanks a lot for inviting me, Angela. Um, so my area, as Angela uh, introduced, uh, I kind of focus on tax law and especially US and China tax law uh, with my background in uh, the US and in China. So for today's topic, I'm going to discuss how the Chinese policy is targeting around the rich people and uh, digital giants. And, um, you know, uh, we see this news lately about common prosperity proposed uh, by President Xi Jinping. And this is actually uh, not a new concept in China because um, when Deng Xiaoping first started the, uh, the open door policy in 1978, he mentioned that uh, we also need to bring this country to common prosperity, which is like the ultimate goal that has been set up in late 1970s. And he mentioned that it, it's a famous quote from them. He said, uh, whether it's a black cat or white cat, it's a good cat if it can catch its mouse. So common prosperity in today's concept, in today's um, environment, it's definitely not in 1970s anymore. So we're gonna look at how the tax policy can you know, affect the country's agenda to um, achieve common prosperity. And um, this person, uh, he is very famous, not only in China, but also in the US. Um, probably would, you would be more familiar with this uh, documentary, uh, President Ob uh, Obama and uh, Michelle Obama, they invested in this documentary called American Factory. Well, American Factory in this movie actually features Cao Du Wang, a Chinese entrepreneur. And what he has been doing um, lately uh, over the past few years is he bought this GM plant in Dayton, Ohio, and set up his uh, glass manufacturing company based in Ohio. And when he started this uh, corporation based in America, in Ohio, he mentioned he actually paid more tax, corporate income tax in China compared to what he has been paying in the US for this um, plant he set up in Ohio. So one reason is he received a lot of tax incentives from the Ohio uh, state government uh, because they want to in, uh, attract him in the state, in Ohio specifically. So he, they gave him a lot of tax benefits. But um, there are other reasons behind, which goes to my uh, later points about effective tax rate. However, Cao Du Wang as a rich person in China, he also is a great person who has been doing charities um, for over 37 years. And he has donated, as you can see, uh, more than 16 billion RMB. And you know, when we talk about Chinese rich people, there's another person you couldn't neglect, you know, Jack Ma, right? But um, there's a huge distinction, a distinguishment between Jack Ma and Cao Du Wang's um, donation. Um, so Jack Ma, um, he has this uh, giant digital company, Alibaba, and you know, Alibaba is uh, listed overseas. So when we think of those um, Chinese tech giants listed overseas, the first impression comes to you as, at least comes to me as a tax person is, I can tell their shares is overseas. So, which means their assets are overseas. You know, the shares are intangible assets. So they don't need to transfer anything because the shares are basically originated in uh, overseas uh, market. 
So uh, comparing to uh, Mr. Tao, his uh, money was either generated in the US or in China. And for Alibaba's, um, those top executives, including Jack Ma and other um, executives, they have been doing charities for many years. However, he donated, Jack Ma donated from a charity foundation based in Singapore. And he, unlike Mr. Tao, who donated the cash directly to the Chinese, uh, Jack Ma donated via this um, charity foundation based in Singapore. And what he has been using in his charity foundation is he donated his shares, Alibaba's shares, to the charities based in Singapore. So on, by this um, very sophisticated structure, um, Jack Ma basically helped himself to avoid the uh, income tax based in China. You know, he is a Chinese person, as long as we can assume. <laughs> well, I don't know exactly whether he has any other passport or not, but at this point, we can assume he's a Chinese tax resident. And according to China's individual income tax law, as a Chinese resident, you should pay a worldwide income tax to the Chinese government. But when Jack Ma donated to this single ch charity foundation under his own um, structure with another holding company based in Cayman, I wouldn't dig into the details, but all this structure helped him in the end to avoid being taxed upon his Alibaba's shares. So Mr. Tao, when he donated, all his donations is after tax income. You know, he has been paying income tax and after his income tax, he donates the rest of his income. So uh, for Jack Ma, um, the distinction is um, he donates his shares without subjecting to China's individual income tax. And um, if he doesn't do this structure, and if he sells his shares, Alibaba's shares in the market, he would be eventually subject to 20% individual income tax in China. So there are two ways, basically, we just discussed the two ways for the rich people in China to donate. And um, here's a paragraph. I, this is a graph I found about US and China to give you a basic concept of how these two countries differ in the tax system. Um, I know we have a very wide audience, so some people may not be familiar with uh, tax. And I just give a very brief uh, introduction of these two graphs. Um, as you can see on the left side, the US one, uh, it's uh, US tax revenue uh, for the federal uh, government. And um, most of the income, uh, the tax revenue in the US is from individual income tax, right? 50%. And uh, payroll tax is 36%. Corporate income tax is only 7%. Um, access and estate and other taxes is 8%. So, the, um, so there are many takes, takeaways from the US side. And one of the takeaway is the US relies upon di direct tax. Uh, you, you know, direct tax means you tax the enterprise or the individuals directly. So US, at least, it depends upon 57% uh, of direct tax, right? And on the right-hand side, the Chinese uh, tax revenue. So uh, Chinese tax revenue mainly comes from what? Value-added tax, VAT, which US doesn't have. Uh, and the US, because um, uh, I started in the US, and uh, I know US doesn't introduce VAT, but at the state level, US has state sales tax which the state legislation can give power to decide. But in China, since 2016, uh, China started this overall uh, VAT reform, which changes or eliminates business tax uh, during the past two decades and changes to VAT. So uh, VAT is about 50%. And VAT is an indirect tax, which means you don't tax um, the income generator in the first place, but you, you tax it during the process. So this is a major part of Chinese uh, tax revenue. And we look at the second corporate income tax uh, around 30%. So corporate income tax, we have to think about the statutory rate in China is 
25% um, is around the mid-level uh, uh, between all the G20 countries. Um, China, uh, you know, France is around 33%, which is the highest. And the US is 21%. Uh, and UK is 17 to 19%. And China is around 25%. But a huge um, distinction is China's individual income tax is about 80%. And looking at the U.S. side, it's about 50%. Um, so this should give you some puzzle, right? Like, we see all these rich people in China, but why is China's individual income tax is only so little um, comparing to all the other tax revenue? Um, well, there's another one, consumption tax, which I wouldn't talk much because consumption tax is like uh, access tax. It only tax upon certain um, goods. Like um, you, you know, uh, gasolines, which is also taxed in the U.S. Uh, and the tobaccos. So these are other sort of goods. Um, but um, the picture, uh, the picture told us there's uh, a different tax system the two countries are using. Um, China relies upon indirect tax, and the U.S. Uh, rely upon direct tax. So the two countries have a different agenda. And the US, as we see from uh, Trump tax reform and Biden's tax reform, which I will discuss in the end of our discussion, um, Biden is trying really hard to raise corporate income tax, which Trump has been reduced. So uh, in, for China, uh, the Chinese government is also considering to increase the individual income tax revenue. Um, so let's see how uh, these two countries have been doing to improve, or at least to work on this tax system. You know, um, the actress, uh, they are very famous actresses in China, um, Fan Bingbing and Zheng Shuang. Um, well, Fan Bingbing got uh, into the huge, um, you know, tax efficient. Uh, it's not a crime for her because uh, it was her first um, first time being caught by the SAT. So uh, she was not doing any criminal wrong. Same for uh, Zheng Shuang. So they did not be, uh, so the Chinese criminal um, tax uh, enforcement department was not um, prosecuting them after uh, criminal charges, but they are being fined significantly for income tax evasion. And the reason they are being, um, you know, investigated over the past uh, few years, especially for Fan Bingbing, um, and he, um, and, um, you know, the person on the right hand side, he was the reporter, and he, uh, re he was like a whistleblower. So he whistleblowed that Fan Bingbing has been evading tax. With this information, the tips, the Chinese government started to investigate Fan Bingbing. And the number for Fan Bingbing's charge is uh, even higher than Zheng Shuang. Um, and it was about uh, 884 million yuan for um, RMB for Fan Bingbing. Um, they, both of them, the actresses, they have been using yin yang contract. I, I'm sure you have read in the news. So they create uh, a different contract for tax purpose. However, the reason that underlying, underlying reason for tax is um, China indeed creates different tax uh, policies for individual income tax. We will take a closer look. So this chart provides you uh, the progressivity rate. And you can see uh, if you are paying salaries, wages and salaries, which is called ordinary income tax in the US, and it's called wages and salaries in China, you will be taxed uh, according to the progressivity rate from 3% to 45%. And the first 5,000 RMB is exempted. So for the rich people like Fan, uh, they probably would be taxed under 45%. So what she has been doing and other actresses, what they have been doing is they set up a uh, sole proprietorship. Um, so proprietorship helps them to pay under a different scheme, which is, this uh, which is this chart, the business income tax rate. As you can see from the title, um, the enterprise owned by individuals from privately owned business, so proprietors or partnerships, they are taxed at a different schedule. So the highest rate is 35%, which is already lower than 45%, right? And uh, on top of that, they have been using the tax incentives from the local government. 
the local governments, including uh, Shanghai and uh, Wuxi or uh, Zhejiang province, like Dongyang, and some actors and actresses, they use Qinghai. Um, and nowadays, Hainan is a really popular place for them to set up the sole proprietorship. With these uh, tax incentives from the local governments, various local governments, um, they can enjoy tax return from the income tax they already paid. Um, and the local governments, the purpose is definitely not to uh, help them to you know, evade tax in any sort of reason, but the local government purpose is to attract business to the local um, place, to the cities or to the towns. So eventually they make their uh, effective tax rate rel relatively lower than the middle class in China. And uh, I have another chart, which is uh, the personal service income tax rate. You can see there are three uh, rates. Um, so when I first uh, started to uh, apply the Chinese individual income tax law and write about the difference between China and the US, you probably would tell immediately the US doesn't have these classified schedules, right? Uh, because China is using a different schedule, it's called a consolidated and a classified individual income tax. Um, classified means um, the different income types. If you are earning personal service income, which is um, separate from your wages and salaries, you will be paid under the uh, right-hand column. But if you're employed by an enterprise, the enterprise has to withhold your income directly from your salaries. So that is on the left-hand side. And um, the rate is different. That is how China ends up with a classified income tax system. And in the US, uh, which I will show up later, uh, it is uh, only one consolidated individual income tax return. And um, when we think of common prosperity, we we'll probably uh, in Hong Kong, especially the um, stockholders in Hong Kong, would think of, well, maybe I don't have much income from my employer because my income is in the stock market or I'm an investor, right? So you would think about capital gains, but in China, uh, strict, uh, strictly speaking, the country doesn't have a capital gain tax under the, the definition of the Internal Revenue Code in the US. So what China has is um, the uh, tax cap, uh, imposed upon um, capital, you know, uh, stock shares. So stock shares, uh, it has a different schedule as uh, many other countries do, like in the US, um, you will be taxed upon the holding period and the tax rate would differ uh, based upon your holding period. So if you're holding less than one month, you are likely to be considered as a short-term trader. So for a short-term trader, the rate uh, is higher, which is 20% in China. And if you hold your stock between one month to one year, you will be taxed at 10%, a lower rate. But in the US, if it's a, you are a short-term trader, you will be taxed your capital gain tax will be the same as your ordinary income tax, so which is much higher than China. And the cash dividends, uh, up to 2015, it is um, tax exempted. So um, I also want to introduce the tax exempt um, benefit. If you are a second um, market, you are in the second secondary market. So if you invest in the secondary market from um, you know either Shanghai, Shenzhen. Um, and your investment in the secondary market is still tax exempted. This tax exemption started in the mid 1990s because China wants to, in the mid 1990s, the government wanted to encourage people to be on the market, on the secondary market. So that has been a tax exemption up until today. And if you're a primary market holder, which means you, if you are a private equity holder, you will be taxed on the, uh, the transaction of your shares. So um, about Cao Liuwang's case, well, as we, got, we just discussed about his donation, because his donation, uh, he has been doing continuing donations for over 30 years. And before 2018, um, China's new individual income tax law, uh, the restriction on individual income tax deduction is very, very restrictive. 
And um, it is, uh, so after the in individual income tax reform, uh, the donor can deduct around 30% of their taxable income in general. But it is really hard for the donor to get the certificate from the donee. You know, the donee, which is um, the enterprise in China that is registered as a uh, charitable uh, enterprises. For example, I'm a full-time employee in the university and the university has a certificate because I have been doing this for the university over the past few years. And I know the university is a tax exempt organization as a charitable organization. So the university basically gives the donee a certificate to tell for the donee to use in the future when they are using the individual income tax filing system and to prove they have been making donations. So they can deduct over around 30% and uh, they cannot carry forward, which means if you donate more than 30%, you cannot carry forward. And in last year, because COVID-19, the government provides a tax incentive. If you're making donations to like the Red Cross or to certain hospitals, you can deduct the full amount. It doesn't matter how much uh, you are donating, but if you are donating uh, during that period, you can deduct the whole uh, amount. And for corporate, it is uh, capped at 12%. And you can carry forward the excessive portion after three years, for three years. But, um, so we have to go back to Jack Ma's. Uh, Jack Ma donated, you know, the shares to Singapore ch charities. So our Jack Ma's uh, structure for his donation, if it's, he was making the donation in China, it is deemed as the income sales. So his donation would, wouldn't be um, tax-free as cash is always tax-free, but as um, you know, donating of the shares, it is treated as in-kind donation for sales. So he would still be taxed uh, for the donat donation of shares. And that is the reason we don't see many donations for stock shares in China. So for corporations, what they have been doing most regularly is they buy um, the goods like face masks, drugs or pharmaceuticals uh, or any um, things that they think would be helpful for the donee. So they buy the goods first and they write off on the expenses. That is the most um, safe way because um, it would be a legitimate purpose, you know, all of the ordinary and necessary expenses for the corporate. And because um, uh, I understand this is also a discussion about the rich people. So rich people means they may have been changing their um, passport or they may have different tax residents. Um, it is especially um, common for the people who travel between uh, China and mainland China and Hong Kong, because you know Hong Kong is regarded as a tax haven in the world. So many Chinese, rich Chinese, they have been trying hard to get uh, Hong Kong's tax resident, and the reason is to enjoy the lower tax in Hong Kong, and um, well, not only Hong Kong but also other tax haven places which we will discuss, like Singapore. Cayman, um, BBI, ABI, those places, they are quite popular for the Chinese, the rich Chinese. So in the 2018 uh, individual income tax reform, China revised the tax residence statute and it becomes effective in 2019. So under the new statute, uh, China introduced the concept of 183 days, which is uh, used in other places as well. So if you stay in China for over 183 days in a calendar year, in a tax year, you are regarded as a Chinese resident. And China has the worldwide income tax. Uh, you know, the US is the other big country with, with worldwide tax. So they will be subject to their worldwide income in China. However, if you stay less than 183 days, uh, you are non-resident in China and your income will be subject, your in, in, individual income tax is only be taxed upon China source. So for example, if you're just coming to China for travel, uh, for uh, you know, work-related travel, and um, your source 
based generated in China will be taxed. And how does China decide your tax resident? Uh, China follows the OECD general rules and the bilateral treaties with other countries. Um, basically, uh, the document look at your uh, residence, residence status with uh, especially the Chinese Shenzhen, the ID, and your family background. If your family, your generations of generations have been in China, even with a US green card, you are still regarded as a Chinese tax resident because you only travel to the US, for example, for the green card reason, like two or three months, you will still be a Chinese tax resident. And economic ties, which matters a lot to the rich people, because if the enterprises are based in China, it doesn't matter where they are, they could hold Australian passport, but they, um, the executives employed by a Chinese enterprise, these, their in, in economic ties is, you know, in China, so they would be regarded as a Chinese individual. And um, so Chinese nationals, if they are working in uh, Hong Kong, but not on a regular basis, they're likely to be considered as a Chinese tax resident. Um, common reporting standard is not a new concept uh, in the countries who signed up with the o who signed up uh, and together with OECD members. Um, actually, the US started um, during the Obama administration for uh, the fact of your foreign account tax, com tax compliance act. And when the US first started the FATA rule, which, uh, and which basically asks the other countries to sign bilateral treaties with the US, so China and Hong Kong included, they entered into two different models. China is in model one and Hong Kong is in model two. But no matter what model the two jurisdictions is under with the US, um, on the FATA rule, both um, Chinese financial institutions and the Hong Kongs, they have to report US persons to the IRS, Internal Revenue Service in the US. So what China has been doing since FATA rule is to ask all the banks, all the financial institutions based in China to ask the clients whether they, you have a US relation, whether you are you're US tax resident or not. You have to declare by yourself. So when the company reporting standards uh, introduced um, in China, it is nothing new to the banks in China because they have been doing this practice for many years before. And the common reporting standard is a, you know, a whole another regime created outside of the US, right? US plays by the fact of rule, but the other 105 jurisdictions, they created the CRS by themselves. So China is a part of the CIS regime. And uh, if you want to have more insights about how the CIS has been enforced in China, um, I think based on what the government disclosed, we can see by the end of December 2018, all the financial institutions, they have to complete the due diligence investigations about their clients' information. So I talked to many financial institutions, the banks, investment banks um, regularly, and I think they have been doing a uh, really good job on due diligence regarding their clients' information, especially anti-money laundering purpose. They have very strict anti-money laundering uh, policies to follow. So this helps um, the SAT to collect information. Well, another note on this. So US signed up with uh, the other jurisdictions on the fact of rule, right? So Chinese government, for example, and Hong Kong as well, have to collect information for the US government. But the US has never done any law similar to the CIS domestically. What does this mean? So the US has never enforced any financial institutions in the US to collect foreign persons information. If you go to a bank in the US, like Bank of America, they don't have a duty under the FACA rule or on the CIS to collect your tax resident information, which means the IRS doesn't have information whether you are Chinese or Hong Kongers or Singaporean, they don't know. There's no state level law in the US. So, which is another question, it's not a purpose of our discussion today, but just to keep in mind, this actually creates a huge loophole for the people who has US connection. 
And um, so I brought it up before, China has uh, the worldwide income tax rule for both individual and enterprises. So it's, it's, it is very related to who you are, like where's your tax resident? So the first test is always to decide where you are from as a tax resident, because we can only discuss how to tax you after we discuss who you are. If you're tax as a Chinese tax resident, you have to report your worldwide income tax generated in foreign jurisdictions. So um, usually the first test is to decide whether you're a Chinese tax resident. And if it is a yes, we look at the following items to decide how your foreign income will be taxed in China. And um, announcement number three, which is a very, very new announcement. And um, this recent announcement provides us with the guidance of how China would tax foreign income. Um, so China before the 2018 uh, individual income tax reform, um, individual side, it doesn't, the government doesn't have a very strong anti-avoidance rule. So um, with this context, there are so many rich people in China avoiding tax like Jack Ma with the shares overseas, right? And the government is trying hard to come up with new rules and regulations to tax foreign income. And after 2018, China started to use uh, anti-avoidance rules um, from borrowed from the corporate side to the individual side. So uh, nowadays, China has the anti-avoidance rule against individual income tax. Um, well, because Biden presidency, um, there's a huge uh, debate about uh, individual income tax reform in the US as well. And Warren Buffett uh, had a very famous quote uh, when he first talked to President Obama. He said, oh, I'm paying a lower tax rate than my secretary. And this also points to an identical question in China, because we see China tax the stock shares at 20% and the dividends at a lower rate are exempted. And if you are um, investing in the secondary market, you're basically tax exempted at all. So China shares the exact same problem as the US. And uh, let's just take a brief look at what the US has been doing to resolve Warren Buffett's question. So um, for Warren Buffett, you know, um, his income, he's an investor, he's an active investor. So his income is most likely to be called capital gains, right? And for his secretary, uh, the secretary is getting wages and salaries. So the secretary is paying under a different uh, bracket, which is uh, highest to uh, 90, 30, 39%. So, um, Let's uh, take a look at another guy, and I will come back to Warren Buffett just in a second. Um, Zuckerberg, like Jack Ma, uh, he announced he would donate 99% uh, of his Facebook shares to the charity, um, Chan Zuckerberg Foundation, right? When his uh, first baby was born. So he, in, he, indeed, he did donate his shares in Facebook. So similar problem as Jack Ma, he's donating his shares. By donating the shares, the rich people, they can write off their tax burdens. If they sell their shares, they have to pay income tax. But if they donate their shares, they basically doesn't face any tax burdens. So uh, Warren Buffett, about his um, income, it's never a puzzle compared to Trump. You know, Trump is the first president in the US never disclosed his tax return. And then when the New York Times uh, investigated him for over a decade, they found he only paid around 700 USD uh, last year, right? So that caused a huge, um, you know, tax concerns. And it is still an open case in the uh, second circuit in New York. So um, for Warren Buffett, his effective rate is 16%. How much is 16%? You know, his secretary is paying at 39%. And he is paying at 16%, which is very, very low rate. It's almost as the flat rate in Hong Kong. And Mitt Romney, which is also another president candidate, 
uh, years ago, um, he ran against Obama. And he's a Republican. So uh, for his income, he also has a lot of capital gains. And his effective rate is even lower. The reason we know his tax return is he disclosed it when he was running for the president. So he also said, I'm paying at a very low tax rate. And his effective rate is around 13.9%. So they are usually, uh, so as tax scholars and practitioners as well, we usually um, come with two reasons. And the first thing is the main income is from capital gains and the dividends, which is a lower rate. And as I uh, discussed earlier, China also has a lower rate for the capital gains and the dividends. And the second, they donate a lot. Um, Warren Buffett donated a lot to Gates Foundation right? And when he donates to Gates Foundation, he can write off his donation from the tax, individual income tax return. So Mitt Romney does the same thing. And um, he personally said, I donated around 40% of my income and he can write off, right? So all these reasons make the rich people in the US pay very low tax and also for Jack Ma as well. Um, I'm showing up this, uh, chart the brackets to give you some um, comparison because I will show you the Chinese ones before and in the US the individuals uh, you know there's two columns the individual and the marriage joint filing one so the individual one in the Trump administration Trump cut it the highest rate from 39 percent to 37 percent and um, this is the uh, the Blue one is the ordinary income tax rate, which is called uh, wages and salaries most of the time. And the capital gains rate is uh, three brackets, 0, 15, and 20. So for Warren Buffett, his statutory rate is only 20%. And with his donations, he's paying a very low rate, as we just see. And um, there's another uh, huge reform that has caused disturbance between Republican and uh, Democrats in the US is estate tax. So which what comes to my next point of estate tax in China. But um, just to give you a brief concept of what is estate tax. Estate tax, or it's, um, it, it is a tax basically imposed upon the rich person. Why is it on a rich person? If you have uh, your estate uh, by the time of your death, that is worth more than 11.7 million USD, then you will be paying estate tax. And it is double for a married couple. So the threshold is extremely high, right? And it was not this high before Trump administration. Trump raised it twice, doubled it basically in 2017. So this is the exemption we have at 20, uh, this year, 11.7 million for individual. So after this exemption um, threshold, the estate will be taxed from 18% to 40%. Uh, many rich people, they don't like uh, Clinton, Hillary Clinton, when she was running against the Trump. And one significant reason back in 2016 was um, she raised an even higher estate tax for the rich. So she proposed an estate tax to around 60%. And Bernie Sanders proposed it to 80%. You know, for the rich people, they definitely hate the concept of estate because they have their estate, right? And in China, you would think, um, well, China doesn't have estate tax, right? Yes. So there has been speculations in the market or in the whole practice, practice area, like whether there would be estate tax in the future or not. Um, we don't know yet. And uh, even in the individual income tax reform in 2018, um, the Chinese government has never uh, brought it up in the tax reform. So um, up until today, the estate tax or inheritance in tax in China is still in a question in the air. And uh, many rich people in China already started to worry about what if China introduced the concept of estate tax in the next few years? Well, there would be a lot of technical barriers. 
for example, China is still in the reform period of uh, you know, the real estate registration. All the real, real property in China has to be registered and all the stock shares has to be registered. But the whole country is still in the reform process of registering your properties. It may still take a few years to finish this reform in the first place. So it, it would take longer time to um, you know, clarify who owns this property first. And for real, uh, so for inheritance tax, there will be um, an, another burden on the uh, state tax uh, bureaus, especially the local tax bureaus, which doesn't have this system to administ administer in the first place. And the rich people, like what they have been doing in the US, the whole world is copying the US rich people because they have been avoiding estate tax for a long time by borrowing other um, passport or by um, transferring their assets abroad. So that is um, the tax avoidance regime widely used in the US like trust foundations um, or the overseas um, foreign trust, foreign rental trust, all the ways are helping the rich people to avoid estate tax, which I think the Chinese rich people could pick up really quickly if the government actually imposes such a new tax. So um, for President Joe Biden's common, what the US doesn't call the concept common prosperity, but the US is talking about trickle down all the time, right? So he was suggesting in May to increase capital gain tax from 20% to 39.6%. 39.6%, what is this rate? It is the individual income tax rate at President Obama's period, the highest tax bracket. So what he has been um, settled with uh, his party is it would not be 39%, but it will be a, another high rate. Um, so he started first he started with this American Families Plan, which is a huge agenda for uh, during the past few months, and it is uh, effective now. And the reason I mention it here is I think China is, do is doing the same thing. China is um, introducing this um, deduction scheme in the individual income tax, and it allows um, people with children or with education needs to deduct their expenses for the childcare and for uh, education of uh, training programs. And this is also happening in the US. So uh, this is um, uh, Biden's American Families Plan. Uh, if you have any questions about this, you can we can talk um, afterwards. But this is just to provide you to see how the US is doing also for, to distribute or redistribute wealth. So currently, this is what I found. Uh, well, on September 20th, um, it is the most recent uh, news, um, as I found on September 20th. Um, they are introducing the rate uh, from 20% um, to 25%. We just said Biden introduced it to 39%, which is very, very hard for the Republican to uh, agree on. So he finally agreed on 25%. And um, he will add another 3% surcharge if you are a married couple with income um, above 5 million and 3.8% net investment income tax will be included if you have an active pass-through business income. Pass-through business means um, business like partnerships, uh, LLCs, and S corporations in the US. So if you are having an active partnership, uh, your income will have a surcharge of 3.8%. And the corporate rate, China has a corporate rate of 25%, as we just said, and the new, uh, Biden administration is thinking of raising it to 26.5%. Well, uh, Obama, during his presidency, it was 35, so Trump reduced it to 21, and Biden proposed to raise it to 26.5. And this is China's corporate income tax. Um, so, uh, the simple answer, if you're just asking um, any taxpayers, like what is China's 
uh, corporate income tax rate, um, the answer is 25. But if you're asking, like, what is um, the tax incentives? So the tax incentives, uh, there are um, well, two ways of um, giving the tax incentives. The first is decided upon your industries. And the second is about locations. So for the industries, if you're a high uh, tech enterprise, especially like um, internet um, companies are far away um, for producing chips. So they are qualified as high tech and they get a 15% lower rate. And if you bring this uh, technology to a further advanced stage and you become a uh, integrated circuit IC design or key software enterprises, you would get a 10% rate. So this is the lowest rate, statutory, statutory rate at 10%. And I have been, I was asked by the question before, like how would the global minimum tax affect China's corporate? And uh, the simple answer is it wouldn't affect China's corporate tax much. Because you see the rate, right? The global minimum tax rate is at 15%. And China has been having tax above 15% for most of the time. And the 10% um, rate is only granted to very, very minimum amount of uh, enterprises. And um, the third thing is China has assessment tax, which is called in Chinese. Um, it doesn't follow the statutory rate, but it, uh, the government will come to your place and provide you uh, assessment tax. And um, I think it only happens um, in partnership or in any other pass-through entities. And the VAT, um, so VAT is based on industries and here uh, is um, the effective rate for small business. Um, the reason I put small business here is, um, which well goes to my next point about digital giants because they are using small business to help the digital giants to avoid tax. You know, small business um, in most places, in most countries, they are enjoying a lower rate. So China provides a, a tax incentive for small business as well, especially uh, from this year to next year, they will be taxed at 2.5 or 10%. So uh, this is the VAT rate. Uh, I'm sure you, you will have a better idea of the VAT if you're doing business in China, because um, you always get the VAT invoices, right? So this is the VAT rate. And uh, for the high tax uh, enterprises, they also get these super R&D deductions. So what is super R&D deductions? Um, for the ma manufacturing enterprises in China, the rate increased from 75% to 100%, which means if the manufacturing enterprise spends around 1 million in R&D, they can deduct 2 million for Chinese in, uh, corporate income tax purpose that is called super deduction. Uh, so I will discuss uh, the digital giants issue um, with the example of DD and uh, Meituan Dianping. So um, the first thing comes to mind when we talk about digital giants is who is the taxpayer? Is the taxpayer Dianping or is the taxpayer uh, the service provider? You know, Dianping on this side, the uh, yellow bike. Um, if you have been in China, if you are in China, you're probably familiar with these two German bikes, right? So how come DD becomes a sharing bike company owns Qingju? And how come Meituan becomes a sharing bike company owns Meituan's sharing bike? Because technically, the lead of these big giants, they are in this sharing bike industry, right? So we have to take a closer look at the structure. So uh, I brought these uh, invoices um, from my own um, use. And um, you can see uh, for DD, it's basically issues different types of VAT invoice. It has a 13% rate if you're in the rental business. If your rental, uh, the property, it is 13% rate. And it also has 6% rate, which is about intangible properties. It provides you 6% rate. And you look at this company, it's called DD Chuxing Beijing Internet Platform. So internet platform, um, 
it is definitely not a sharing bike company, right? Sharing bike means you have to basically own the bike. So who owns the bike? It's possibly it's another subsidiary on the DB. And here we have a uh, tax exempt, right? DD choosing Koji, Koji means technology. So they are likely, the Koji uh, limited company, they are likely to have a high tech enterprise status. So they can enjoy a tax exempt status. And the other one, 6%, which is about uh, the added value IT service. And this is also given by another company called Hangzhou's Xiaomi uh, um, Software Technology Company. So basically, even we're just talking about DD1 company, they provide you four tax rates. And they uh, have, so the question is, well, how can they do this and why they're doing this? And I had this discussion with a uh, tech official uh, in Shanghai government um, just two weeks ago. And I think the government is also trying to solve the problem. Um, which means we don't have a certain answer yet. And uh, about three weeks ago, I had this conference with Oxford University. And uh, in that uh, seminar, we also discussed platform tax issues. So this is not a Chinese uh, problem. This is a shared problem with many, many countries about sharing platforms. Um, also, you think of Uber and Airbnb. Like Uber is a similar company to DD, right? Uber used to be uh, in China for a few years before DD bought it up. So when Uber was in China, or when Uber is currently elsewhere, the problem is who is the service provider? Should it be Uber or Uber's driver? But we don't ask Uber's driver to give you any invoices, right? Because it will ask them a lot of burdens. So we asked Uber to provide you the invoices. So for Uber's driving service, it is unlikely to be transportation, right? And transportation is uh, under this rate in China. Mm. You see, transportation is 9% rate in China for VAT. But if it is an other service, it could be at 6%, like, you know, uh, technology consumer service. So it is 6% rate. Um, US doesn't have VAT, but and other countries like European countries, they also have VAT. So many European scholars are also concerned how big platforms would be taxed. And um, so this is unresolved the question of, uh, of digital platforms tax, like who should pay the tax. And small business, so usually, um, the common practice we have been seeing is these big giants, they bought up small business and their subsidiary, the small business can enjoy a lower rate as a small business. And um, this is also help, help them to separate the business segment to enjoy a lower rate. Lastly, about the location, because I mentioned briefly before, China um, provides a lower tax rate based on the industry and on the location. So for the location uh, issue, um, here, you probably heard of um, China's free trade zones um, for many times because you were doing business in China and this is some policy uh, for your own benefits. So um, China has um, many um, free trade zones. Uh, it first started in Shanghai and it has expanded to different provinces. And um, this one, Hainan Free Trade Port, which was um, a huge um, policy um, that, is, um, being that was announced last year. So Hainan Free Trade Port, uh, with this um, purpose to be a very competitive free trade port, similar to Hong Kong, the government grants a lot of incentives um, I'm just gonna discuss tax incentives, but this is a uh, idea for you, like um, how China is giving the incentives in Hainan. The tax rate, um, individual income tax can enjoy a lower rate at 15%. That is also a reason many um, talents or many actors and actresses, they're thinking of moving business to Hainan with this 15% um, lower rate. 
and the corporate rate at 15%, which is lower than the 25% rate, and the duty free shopping. So, this is um, the tax um, incentives um, currently introduced in Hainan. And, um, well, lastly, to wrap up with its um, you know, global uh, digital age. And um, even we had a Trump presidency who is against globalization. We still talk about globalization today. And uh, last, uh, so not last month, uh, in July, um, the OECD inclusive framework countries, they agree upon this 15% uh, GMT rate. 15%, um, what is 15% rate? Um, so there are three jurisdictions against 15% rate. Um, that is Ireland, Hungary, and Estonia. You know, um, Ireland is a very famous tax, not tax haven, but a tax preferential place for corporates. And Ireland statutory rate is 12.5%. And Hungary is lower at 9%. So um, Northwest, these uh, places, they are against the 15% rate. But would that affect China? And I think I just discussed it before. Chinese uh, statutory rate is already above 15%. So it wouldn't affect Chinese corporates like uh, very significantly. And um, well, um, we look at uh, the digital age and these companies um, farm. It is um, most US, it is exclusively US companies. But um, here's another graph. We can see Chinese digital giants, Alibaba, Tencent, Baidu, it's called BAT in China, and Jindong.com. So they are also digital giants. And you would wonder whether these Chinese digital giants would be taxed on the digital service tax, right? The DST reform. So um, it depends on how they um, look at their uh, structure, corporate structure. Alibaba's um, surface overseas is different from Alibaba's surface in China because it has different entities doing the uh, business overseas. Same for Tencent, uh, Baidu, and uh, Jindong. Um, well, there's another company which is more uh, debated, in, uh, especially in last year, ByteDance. Um, so ByteDance is a uh, video streaming service. And um, we, the left column, I prepared you with this comparison of US digital giants and the Chinese digital giants. So ByteDance, um, the issue is more complicated because it's about data. And this is another shared question for the whole international world, like how would a country tax data company, right? We see it is valued at 17 billion or even higher, but the value is most likely to be the data value, right? So how can we impose a tax on the data value? I don't have an uh, answer yet. And um, I think this is a question scholarly, uh, scholars discussed a lot late, lately. And, um, but just to um, think like how this, um, data companies, it is also unlike Google, because Google um, has, um, you know, marketing service, and it has been doing a lot of digital marketing service, but five days is most likely to be data. And here, the uh, tax havens we usually discuss, Hong Kong is, um, you know, a very uh, classic one, but um, we can also see the US. Um, they said in this chart because US has various trust laws to help state trust law to help the rich people to uh, evade tax. And also US has a lot of corporate tax loopholes. So US is also um, regarded as tax paper according to some studies, but not all. And Angela, this is basically what I have. Do you have any questions? Thanks, Stacy. Would you mind stop sharing your screen? So thanks very much for your um, very informative um, presentation. Um, I would like to 
first ask you to clarify a little bit about uh, the question about donation, because during this tech crackdown, we did see a lot of the tech bosses didn't donate yeah. the shares uh, to the charity that they created. Yeah. Um, and in the example that you mentioned a few times, um, you mentioned that Jack Ma donated two shares yeah. to a Singapore charity rather yeah. than a mainland based charity. And there seems to be some story behind it. Would you like clarify a bit about how it works? Um, right. So uh, first, it started with Jack Ma's um, assets, right? His assets, uh, most of his assets is Alibaba's shares. And Alibaba is a company listed first in the US, right? We don't discuss, oh, he's at least um, Alibaba's relisting in Hong Kong, but when he donated um, a few years ago in 2014, the shares is based in New York, right? So it's an overseas asset from the Chinese perspective. And he first set up this Cayman holding company uh, and uh, with different subsidiaries on this Cayman holding company. And there's one specific subsidiary in Singapore uh, for charity purpose. So he donates his shares, Alibaba's shares, um, from, you know, it doesn't have to go through China because it's already overseas. The shares is listed overseas. So he donates the shares to Singapore Foundation. And when the um, donation is completed, the Chinese government cannot, or it is really hard for the Chinese government to tax this Singapore entity because the charity becomes you know, the entity who owns these shares. He separates his personal assets to the shares, to, sorry, to the um, foundations, right? To the um, charity foundations. So it's not his personal asset anymore. So are you saying that if he, had he donated to a China-based charity foundation, he might be subject to yes. tax in China? Yes, right. So China, uh, under the current law, and the donation of um, intangible properties, including stock shares, is regarded as a sale. So he would be subject to income tax. Right. Well, I, get, I, I, I have sympathy for why he wants to do that, right? I mean, of course, he's already donating money um, and he doesn't want to, you know, uh, to be subject to a further tax. So I wouldn't think that is a form of tax um, avoidance since he's trying to, um, to, to do, uh, do it for a charity purpose. And I would like to follow up. Um, we actually received some questions from the audience um, before your presentation. And I'd like to also encourage our audience to ask questions if you have uh, yeah. any into the chat box. Uh, but I want to first follow up with the question about property tax. Um, I remember around 2014, there have been some legislative proposals um, that China will introduce a property tax. But now after years of debate, we haven't seen much progress. And now with the common prosperity charity, uh, you know, this policy initiative, do you see the possibility that China might accelerate um, the introduction of the property tax? And if that's the case, what do you foresee will be the timeline and how would it be introduced? Right. Yeah, I think this is, uh, you know, speculation. The market talks a lot lately, the property tax. Um, so China, uh, over the past few years, has already have um, implemented property tax in two cities, Shanghai and Chongqing. Um, for example, in Shanghai, uh, if you have your principal residence and you and you also have an actual home, actual apartment, so your principal residence wouldn't be taxed, but your actual the second home will be taxed. And um, this is a example, sorry, this is an experiment started in Shanghai and Chongqing. And um, the property tax is not to tax upon your average, like if we regard for in Shanghai, each person has a 60 uh, square meters exemption. And we, uh, the government wants people to have a comfortable living. So 60%, 60 square footing, square uh, meter is regarded as you know, a comfortable living space. So this wouldn't be um, taxed. And when we talk about property tax, uh, we probably care like whether other cities would adopt property tax, right? And I don't see any clear uh, timeline yet. 
because uh, we can see um, on the news, the government has been discussing this for several years already, but um, at which point would the government um, have uh, like a countrywide property tax? Um, it's still up in the air. Right, I see. And then there's another, um, a lot of discussion about another form of tax that is a capital gain tax, right. um, which China doesn't have. Right. And um, have you seen any updates that China might introduce uh, American type of capital gain tax or is it off the table? Right, um, so uh, capital gains, China doesn't call it capital gains tax, right? But um, if we look at the characters of the properties um, in question, the characters like, um, for example, uh, the stocks you hold, right? In the US, it is called capital gain. It is uh, under the category of capital gain for stock holding, right? But China doesn't call it capital gain tax. And uh, in the US dividend, it's also called capital gain, right? But China tax dividend as well. It is just not being called as a capital gain. And um, I remember uh, I discussed with a professor in New Zealand, and she told me like in New Zealand, we don't talk about capital gain tax because there's never a capital gain tax separate from ordinary income tax. So to some extent, it is about how a country defines a term. Even it's about same product, but it's just a different term. Right, I see. And then um, you also mentioned like, you know, a lot of the Chinese tech companies are because they're listed overseas. Right. So for a lot of the tech bosses, um, you know, effectively, a lot of their assets are overseas. Yeah. And some of them have um, set up family trusts uh, to optimize their wealth. Uh, but at the same time, you also mentioned, you know, if you're a Chinese resident, um, for tax purpose, um, even if the overseas income are potentially subject to tax, to, to right. Chinese tax. So how effective is the Chinese government in enforcing, um, you know, these rules? Um, because, because these assets are overseas, it's very difficult to, to monitor and what's right. going on. And especially, you know, there are so many I saw there's a lot of law firms um, helping the clients to set up uh, family trust overseas. You know, yeah. I saw, you know, like Jack Ma and Richard Liu from JD, they all have family trust. Yeah. Um, and, and there's a lot of reports, you know, the Chinese tycoons are now transferring billions of dollars to the family trust um, to try to avoid uh, chi Chinese income tax. So I wonder, you know, wh what is the government doing with regard to all this potential tax avoidance issues or I mean would it ever be you know possible for the government to 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 cramp down on this because because it's just very hard uh, to enforce against overseas assets right yeah so you know um, I, I thought about this issue too because uh, it is really hard to answer because we look at the uh, global system as a whole when there is a tax haven, including Hong Kong and Singapore, Cayman, BBI, there's always incentive for the rich to transfer their assets. Uh, they don't have to transfer assets, just open accounts and use the local system to benefit themselves, like Singapore. It started, Singapore government has this family um, foundation law um, in 2019 or 2020 to attract a lot of foreign investment to Singapore to set up foreign family, sorry, family business, right? Family office. So as long as uh, we have other jurisdictions, um, which has a lower income tax or more preferential tax system compared to others, there will always be incentive for the rich to go there. It doesn't matter if it's a Chinese rich person or a US rich person or UK, um, even for Hong Kong people, when they look at another jurisdiction with a lower tax, like Cayman, they would choose Cayman instead, right? So uh, for China, the rich people in China specifically, I think it matters about the Chinese anti-avoidance rule in the individual income tax system. Um, I discussed this a little bit in my uh, presentation. Uh, China started the anti-avoidance rule for individuals in 2018 and 2019 afterwards. So the anti-avoidance rule depends on how um, strict the SAT has been enforced it, right? So the SAT has uh, the risk department set up uh, in 2019 to follow this um, high net worth individuals. Uh, so they use the big data system, uh, the AI system, 
the AI would follow and automatically check them who have suspicious uh, transaction overseas. And um, IO Shanghai has been doing really a uh, great job on the Shanghai SAT. Um, they have this very sophisticated AI department to follow the uh, high net worth individuals. Right. Um, you mentioned that China has joined a common reporting standard. Right. Um, would that in some way help China to monitor those overseas income and assets of the rich Chinese individuals? And would, yeah? Uh, the common reporting standards? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, right. So yes, um, the common reporting standard has a real case uh, in China when a rich person uh, with tax residents um, in China, a, Guang, a person from Guangzhou. So this is an open case. Um, the Guangzhou government uh, with this CRS um, information transferred from overseas um, depart tax bureaus, they got this um, Chinese tax resident information and the tax uh, this rich person in Guangzhou in that case. So if we're talking about how effective the exchange has been going on, I think um, we will see a growing trend of more countries joining this uh, exchange system. But as we see, it's relatively new for all, all countries. In 2019, we started to exchange, right? So the cases are rare, but we're seeing the growth Right. Um, I remember a few years ago, a lot of the rich Chinese people come to Hong Kong, came to Hong Kong to buy insurance. And it seems like that's also an, another way to optimize their wealth and um, maybe to potentially reduce tax. Um, have you heard China taking any um, actions to, you know, potentially to close this loophole? Right. Um, yes, I heard of this, uh, the I haven't personally dealt with this uh, tax advice yet, but I know um, many Hong Kong based insurance companies, they are trying to attract Chinese rich people to buy their insurance policies. And uh, when they introduce these policies to the Chinese, they said about tax incentives or tax, you know, just to avoid the tax, right? But um, technically, um, if you are buying an insurance policy with a cash value, like if you spend 1 million on buying a Hong Kong insurance policy, right? So that insurance policy on the CRS, it is a reported thing. It's a reported financial asset. Like, um, so it has money, the cash value, right? And when it has the cash value, it, should, it is a reportable asset. And um, the insurance company on the CRS, it is also reporting entities. So, um, you know, in RCIS, the goal is to make it more transparent for jurisdictions, uh, in, including China and Hong Kong, because Hong Kong is also part of CIS. And that insurance, it is basically reportable. And um, I don't see like a huge uh, tax loophole, like whether this insurance would be taxed, because usually uh, insurance is tax in China, unless it is designated uh, for a certain beneficiary, if it's a life insurance policy based in China, right? If you buy a life insurance policy based in China with a certain designated um, beneficiary, then that is a taxable asset for that beneficiary. So, um, but I do see some gray area um, with this Hong Kong practice. Right. Very, very interesting. So um, there was a, a very recent uh, New York Times article about the revolving door between the U.S. Treasury Department and um, the the accounting firms, uh, whereas the the uh, employees from the accounting firms regularly um, work at the, the Treasury Department to learn about um, the latest um, tax uh, um, uh, issues to help the clients, the private clients to optimize their wealth. So it looks like that, you know, however tough tax rules that you introduce, um, there are always ways that, come, you know, wealthy individuals will be able to engage um, very sophisticated advisors to get around it. They are, you know, they have deep pockets to afford um, this kind of um, wealth optimization scheme. So it seems like a very common problem uh, facing uh, countries uh, all, all over the world. Now, my question is like, 
you know, obviously China's problem is not, not unique. And this is something also pointed out by one of our audience. Have there ever been any country that have successfully, you know, taxed their ultra rich or, you know, none of them has, has succeeded so far? Good question. Um, so successfully tax the rich goes back. I mean, or, or is there any countries that have done at least better than others? I mean, there is impossible to close all the loopholes. Oh. But at least some countries have seemed to be fairly more effective than others. Right. Yeah. So I think it goes back to your previous question about enforcement. It, um, you know, all the countries, the rich people, they are trying to find the lowest tax place. Um, and they are using the, taking advantage of the tax payments. And it, so the question goes back to the resident country. How are they enforced this uh, tax avoidance or tax efficient practice by the rich people? And I think uh, I'm going to bring up US, but US probably is not the best one, but US has the very uh, powerful system built up uh, in the world. Even the uh, enforcement is not like, um, I don't have, I don't see a ranking of the countries, how they are enforcing tax avoidance, but US with this FACA rule, Foreign Tax Compliance Act, for, Foreign Tax Account uh, Compliance Act, with this FACA rule, they first designed the whole uh, information exchange system with the purpose to catch the US rich people with accounts overseas. So they have this program with Swiss, Switzerland, it's called Swiss Bank Program. Um, the US set up with uh, Swiss. Mm. Swiss Bank Program, it is only between the US and the Swiss Bank. So Switzerland, uh, it's also regarded as, as a tax paper jurisdiction with the bank privacy law and the tax um, standards. So with this Swiss Bank Program between the US and uh, Switzerland, the US has a better information of its own citizens based in Switzerland. And this also helps the US government to check down who has um, you know, bank account based in Switzerland. But overall, um, it's really hard for me to come up with like one specific country with the best uh, enforcement. Right, I mean, so um, we, are, we have about 10, 12 minutes left. So I would like to turn to um, our audience questions here. Um, let me first ask a question. Um, I think Professor Gao from Gao Pingyang from um, the business school would like to ask a question directly. Um, I don't know whether can you. I tried to unmute you. Can you can you speak now? Yes, you can speak. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I, oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, no, thanks for, for, for the, uh, the talk. Uh, sorry, I missed the, the first half of it, so it might have been mentioned. Uh, but from your discussion about uh, Jack Ma's uh, donation to the Singaporean charity, and then the later discussion, I just would like to clarify that for those tech companies, uh, funders who concentrate their wealth on their shares, of the companies that are listed overseas, uh, what exactly is the, the capital um, control measure related to those shares? So in other words, even though Jack Alibaba's shares are traded in, in New York, is it true that Jack Ma can just simply sell his shares to get USD? My understanding is that as far as I think for companies listed in Hong Kong, let's say for Nongfu Sanchuan, the Zong San San actually cannot get a Hong Kong dollar after uh, selling his shares. The, he, he actually, his shares have to be deposited with an agency and that agency will have certain contracts with some investment banks. And eventually I think like uh, in, in, in Hong Kong, uh, some of the banks I've talked to tell me that essentially they will sell those shares on behalf and then settle an exchange contract with the, the owners to pay them basically in the MIMB. 
So in that sense, even though the shares are traded overseas, their wealth still is circumscribed in within the boundary of China and, and within the currency of the MNB. Uh, Angela, do you want to answer? Or... Yeah. No, no, yeah, yeah, please, please answer. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot for your question, Professor Gao. Um, so about uh, those um, overseas listed Chinese tech companies, um, I don't do corporate law as much as you guys are doing, but um, based on my uh, limited knowledge and experience, um, those tech companies, uh, Jack Ma's or uh, Tencent, um, when they share uh, stocks in the market, uh, my sense is they always have SPVs, uh, special purpose vehicles in the middle, right? And those SPVs, they, are, um, they have very sophisticated structure, overseas structure, including uh, sometimes uh, Hong Kong and also uh, Cayman or uh, uh, some like BVI, those are holding companies in on the top. And there are others uh, likely to be two or three tiers below, right? So this whole structure of SPV helps them to avoid, uh, well, so first, if they're investing themselves, they have to uh, subject to the announcement 37 to report income tax, right? But with these SPVs, um, they can first use the SPV to sell. And it flows down to maybe like an entity in Hong Kong, so um, if you're talking about money, how the currency could come back to China is uh, not my primary uh, practice area, but um, just uh, if the estate is keeping the assets abroad, this shouldn't be a huge concern. I think what you're considering is if they are transferring the money back to China, right? That is a currency regulation problem. Yeah, no, I think the VI structure you were talking about is, is, is a, is is a way for them to uh, be able to list the shares in the overseas market while maintaining that the company is not uh, owned by foreign investors because those industry right. uh, uh, have regulations of uh, not allowing major shareholding by foreign capitals. Now, the, the key issue is to me is more that I think you know in the context of talking about taxing rich people in China. I think a key issue is that whether they will be able to get the money outside of China or not. If the money is inside, inside of China in the form of renminbi, uh, then, then there, there will be a lot of opportunities for the government uh, to take actions. But if by listing your shares overseas, you if effectively could transfer your wealth yeah. Uh, outside of China, then of course, uh, all the talks about the tax haven and about other legal um, tax avoidance strategies could kick in. So uh, therefore, I think it, it, it's probably uh, maybe maybe you should uh, you could do a little bit more work to find out exactly what nature is that. As far as I understand, the Chinese capital control regulation is meticulous. Uh, they they wouldn't leave such a big loop uh, uh, a loophole in the system. Just imagine the whole industry, uh, the overseas listed Chinese shares nowadays probably at about more than two trillion USD. That's uh, that's after the crackdown. It, it, before it, it's more than uh, three point five trillion, which is as large as the entire Chinese uh, uh, foreign currency reserve. So if somehow by allowing those companies to list their shares outside of the market, the, the Chinese government has lost the control of those money, then, then I think there'll be a big loophole. So, so maybe it's worthwhile to find out the, the details. Right. So um, you, you're definitely right about uh, strict capital control rules um, in China. Uh, like uh, the regulation of the currency flow uh, is getting more stricter than before. But uh, when they're using the SPV to list their companies overseas, they're also using the SPV to exit. The whole purpose is not done when they want to exit, right? Be, the, uh, the exit makes them to sell, basically enable them to sell. 
uh, the stocks. So um, there are other ways uh, they can use up um, the structures like, uh, so I think Hong Kong is a really popular place for those listed uh, US or uh, Hong Kong listed companies uh, with Chinese um, primary investors to sell. Because um, if they can have a set, if they set up a business in Hong Kong, an enterprise in Hong Kong, then they can use uh, Hong Kong as, subsidi as, as a subsidiary, as intermediary as well. And um, it depends on whether you want to shift back your um, gains to China. But if you don't want to shift your gains in China, staying in Hong Kong, I think is a very popular choice for the rich people. Right, that's fascinating discussion. So um, because we have a, a few more questions here from the audience, let's first move on. But I, I do think this is something that's worth uh, further investigations um, because it's like, as uh, Professor Gao pointed out, this is an extremely important question. Um, there is an audience that raised a question about the practice of estate tax in Shanghai. Um, you mentioned that Shanghai already introduced the property tax. Yeah. So has Shanghai also introduced an estate tax? Because I had the impression that um, China hasn't introduced any state tax. So correct me if I'm wrong. Right. Uh, you mean estate tax, right? Estate tax, uh, inheritance tax. China doesn't have estate or inheritance tax. No. No, right? I mean, so that was only the property tax that Shanghai introduced, right? Yes. Yeah, I just, yeah, so that's from the audience. Um, yeah, another, uh, some of the audience asked questions about, you know, how exactly China is different uh, from other countries because, um, you know, you seem to be describing China's approach to taxing the rich or the big tax as being different to the US um, in some extent, but similar in others outcome. Do you think it's just the way um, tax system turn out in the 21st century? I mean, I, I wonder, you know, if you want to use one or two sentences to describe, um, you know, the, the, what are uniques about Chinese tax system? I mean, what would it be? To summarize, you know, what is what is exceptional about the Chinese tax system that make China different from other countries like the US? When, when we go through this um, comparative analysis in your presentation. Right, yeah, because I see uh, uh, the question you read is from my um, colleague, Martin Pearson. Um, and he has also been doing a lot of uh, tax treaties um, research, including tax treaties with China. So um, to summarize, I think um, because China started this uh, income tax reform relatively new in 2018. So there's a lot of possibilities. And the possibilities means the Chinese government has a huge room to improve the system. And um, especially when we talk about the rich, the anti avoidance rule in China. Um, the government is doing, using um, the AIs, uh, the blockchains. Uh, technology and uh, the risk management team. They build up this uh, risk management team. And um, so with these possibilities and um, the technology supported both from the government and the um, private enterprises, China is doing a very interesting experiment. The whole country, you know, in the US, you see the turbo tax return filings at software, right? I remember you spent a few years in the US before and we use the tur turbo Turbo tax filing system. So that is something the US has been having for more than a decade. But in China, we can have this uh, software to report, to file our income tax over, like just uh, in 2019, we started to use this software. And now we have this all kinds of software. So you see all this um, new stuff, like it's a blooming place. Um, you see uh, the risk, definitely there are risk anywhere and um, the government is also trying to improve. So I think because China is uh, in an early stage compared to the common law jurisdiction in the UK and the US in anti avoidance system, but China has been doing a great job in enforcing the anti avoidance system. Right, I see. Well, I mean, we are exactly on time. And um, I uh, want to thank Daisy for um, taking an hour and a half, spending one hour and a half with us and to go through this really complicated tax issues. 
Um, and I personally learn a lot. And I, I, at the same time, I also realize how much more I, I need to learn about this topic is so, so complicated and nuanced. And I, I thank the audience for coming to today's present, um, today's webinar. And we have two more uh, webinar relating to uh, laws and common prosperity. And I hope you can uh, come and join us next time. So thank you, everyone, and see you next time. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank